Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Gray Way, Episode 2, uh, African Gray Behavior with Lisa Bono. Uh, welcome, Lisa. Hi, and, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you and all your glorious uh, uh, birds behind you. Um, so while we wait for people to log on, Lisa, um, you want to give us a rundown of, of, your, of your grays, of your flock um, that you have with you today? The oldest one, and I, I guess because the screen is reversed, I can't really tell who's where. Um, my oldest one is Sterling. You may hear him talking in the background. Um, he is about 40 years old. Uh, next one's going to be Sam. Um, she is probably going to be 20. No, she, I think she's going to be 30 this year. Then we have Abigail, and she is about 27. Then we have, I call them the twins. They're not related. They're born months apart, but just because they were raised at the same time, they both just turned 18, and that's Sydney and Emma. So they're all here, and hopefully they'll all behave. <laughs> <laughs> I see them all moving about behind you. <laughs> yeah, I, I loaded their trees up with toys with the hopes that I can show people that a busy beak is a quiet beak. So, that and they're all they're all uh, Congo grays, correct? And that's not, that wasn't by choice. Um, it's just many of them needed new homes, and this is where they came. Gotcha. So, I think the only one that was really purchased um, eighteen years ago was Sydney. So, and do they do they get along? Are they like um... no? <laughs> uh, Sydney is the one that's closest to the door in the back. He does really. He doesn't really like anybody else, so I have to kind of keep him separated, yeah. so he can't get to anybody. Um, he has a slight wing trim because he just has a mind of his own, and he will fly at the other birds, and he will go after them. So we have to make it just a little bit harder for him to do so. So, um, but he can. He can still probably get about probably about 10 feet, but he can't really get up to get on top of the other trees because he will fly and knock them off the tree. So, <laughs> so we need to watch soap operas when you have a flock of grays. You could just, that's a soap yeah. opera in and of itself every day. Yes. <laughs> and the other, the all, other ones all get along just fine, but we have five of everything. So nobody has to share. So Nice. Well, if you're just joining us, we are at the Gray Way episode Two with Lisa Bono, and this is going to be African Gray Behavior. And um, with that said, um, we are hoping to answer some questions. With, well, Lisa, uh, at the end of the towards uh, when she's done with her presentation. So, if you do have a question about your gray or about grays in general, um, please make sure you use the Q and A button and not the chat feature. Um, so, use the Q and A button for your questions and. Um, I think we can get started, Lisa. I know you have a fabulous presentation for us, so uh, why don't we get going with that and then um, we'll take it from there. Okay, let me get it up here. Okay, uh, hold on. I don't know why it didn't start from the beginning. Hold on, slideshow from the beginning. I'm sorry. That's okay. We had it on this yes. before. Um, I don't know why it went back to that. There we go. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that all right? I can see it. <laughs> I'm gonna okay. see it. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today and also to a lot of my friends and clients and on my gray page who have graciously shared their pictures so we can use them as examples. So we're gonna go over some of general behavior. A lot of this can go across species um, and then we're gonna get into a more unique behaviors of the African gray. Right. Many behaviors with our gray parrots are generally programmed for survival, just like their wild cousins. Being domestically raised and living with people does not change something that is instinctual. However, once in our homes, they can use these behaviors and use them for different meanings. 
Okay, these are some of the things that I want to go over. And some of these behaviors are better than others, obviously, from the pictures. But these are all things that pretty much every bird out there will do. Okay, we're going to start with, I'm sorry, I'm having a little problems with my computer here. Um, we're going to start with talking. And arguments can be made through the years that these birds are actually just mimicking what they're taught. Um, with the ones that you live with, you know that that is not true and they use them in context. Um, this is a little bit about Irene and during a session with Alex, they, she presented a bunch of trays that had two sets of colors uh, contained, wait a minute, hold on. I can't seem to get rid of the box that's over here on the corner. Can you give me a little idea how to do that? Oh, um, I'm not sure if that, let's see here. Um, Covering half the screen, so that's why it's throwing me yeah, off. Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, instead of us, I think that's, um, huh. let's see here. Uh, you can move it, I grab it. Okay, yeah, I got myself out of the way. Okay, I grabbed it, thank you. Okay, so they contain sets of two, three, and six objects. The research team asked Alex what color three. Alex responded with five, which made no sense, noting that nothing on the tray equaled five. After several attempts to get Alex to concentrate, and Alex apparently delighted in deliberately giving incorrect answers, Irene Pfefferberg gave in and asked, okay, Alex, tell me which color five, and to which Alex responded, none. So right then and there, and along with your own experiences at home, you know that they're simply not mimicking us. We're gonna go on to a little video here. This is Einstein with mom, Marsha. They're down in Texas, they're doing fine. Um, but this will kind of show you some of the vocabulary they have for the people out there that do not have talking grades. Know that all of them do not talk, but Einstein happens to be fabulous. So we're gonna watch about a minute of the video and you can always catch it later on YouTube. <laughs> All right. What is why is this not working? Okay. <laughs> sorry. But I have oh, well, I got I gotta move this again. I'm sorry, I don't know why this is showing up. I can't get rid of it. Okay, but I have a screaming bird. Yes. Now, what can you do if your bird is just screaming all day? You can see that these guys all have something in common. And hopefully you can see that they all have busy beaks. A busy beak is a quiet beak. Now, before I started with the seminar today, I actually loaded up my bird's play stands. So this way, hopefully I could show you that five will keep quiet as long as they're busy. We shall see. <laughs> Flying. Flying is an excellent and healthy option to give your birds exercise if you're able to do it. You do have to be careful. Um, you have to make sure your environment is safe to begin with. You have to make sure the doors and windows are closed with no accidental escape chances. Toilet seats down, no standing water. You don't have your other animals in the house ready to maybe pounce if they get excited. Your heating elements on your stove. 
all that kind of stuff, that is all part of a safe environment. If you can do that, it's actually a lot healthier for your bird to be able to fly. Now, this is Sydney down here. And this is my guy. This is when he was a young bird. Notice down here that he has his wings clipped. Well, he, everybody asked me, can my, can my bird learn how to fly? Absolutely, and then become very good at it. I have some videos that I'd like to share. I just gotta figure out how to get there. So that <laughs> computer is, it's, it's like the program's not working. It's like I'm not in the right program. Uh, hold on, and I have no mouse. <laughs> oh, look, there's my, there it is. Can you see that? <laughs> um. Where are we looking? Sorry. Uh, this is the actual presentation. Were you able to see this better? I was in the PowerPoint before. That's why it wasn't going right. OK, well, I see the picture of Sydney. Yeah, the. So let, let me see. Now, this is Sydney after. Um, after he learned how to fly. <laughs> Okay, now the next video is how good he got. Now this is, I had a two story house in New Jersey. And instead of me walking up and down the stairs several times a night with the birds, taking them upstairs to their nightly room, he was able to learn how to fly up on his own. Okay, uh, did you, is the video playing now, Lisa? Cause I, it's not showing. Yes, um, it's not showing. Oh, um. If it's on a YouTube, I yeah, I think you have to hit the um, the share screen on YouTube. It's a no. It was on Facebook. Okay. Okay. Um. Hmm. Let me see something. So, is anybody able to see this or not? It says. It, wait a minute. The screen share is paused. It says my screen share is paused. Okay, can you unpause it? Is that a, um, hmm. Doesn't give me that option. Or start sludge. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, it looks like, okay, that's all right. Uh, this is what uh, makes these webinars more exciting is the you never know the elements of unknown. So we've had glitches in the past, but we've, um, okay, okay. Um, let's see here. Is there a slideshow tab? I think someone was suggesting a slideshow tab and then clicking that. Um, Get some um, some IT tech help from our our uh, panel our um, participants. No, I don't see that. Um, okay. Yeah, just next to it where it says stop share, it says you are you are screen sharing. Now it says I am, but you can't see this video. No. Um, Okay. No, but, but you know, I mean, we could, um, I, I could include it on the, you know, force comes first. I, I could include it on the, the landing page for this webinar. Okay. And then I could put the link, links on there, I think. Okay. Just to, yeah. Let's see. Slideshow. Something, something is not working right here on my end, and I apologize. No worries. Okay. Um, all right, taking you guys off the screen altogether. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about, now that we got sidetracked trying to figure out my videos, uh, is <laughs> biting. Now, I have taken my share of bites through the years, and I equate that to me not watching their body language or understanding their body language versus them having bad behavior. Our goal as caregivers and to, is to understand our species so we can live in harmony. Now, behavior serves a purpose, and the outcome shapes future behaviors. So I'm not going to get very technical with this, because there are places you can go to learn all about this. We're just having a talk um, to kind of help you understand. A lot of people will come to me and say, well, my bird bit me. Why do you do that? 
Well, you, you need a little bit more information before you can just give an answer. Otherwise, I'm just grasping at straws. So if something you do results in a favorable outcome, you are going to repeat that behavior. If the behavior results in something you don't like, you're not gonna do it again. There is always reason for a bite. You have to figure out what it is, how can I figure that out, and how do we avoid it in the future? The easiest way to do that and to explain it is to learn your ABCs. The antecedent behavior and consequence model is a tool that you can help people examine behaviors that they want to change, the triggers behind those behaviors, and the impact of those behaviors on negative or maladaptive patterns. So this is what you have to try to think about when your bird bites. Now I had this all animated, but my PowerPoint is not doing it correctly. Um, so the first thing, the antecedent is gonna be, the owner offers the hand in the cage. The behavior is the bird bites. The consequence is the owner closes door and most likely change, it walks away. Um, again, the antecedent is something that happens before the behavior, okay? The example here is the offering hand is the antecedent, the bite is the behavior, and the consequence is the closed door. We really want to strive for, oh, sorry, try to move your people. Okay, we really want to strive for this model. I can't move you guys, there we go. Antecedent, the owner offers hand, the behavior is the parrot steps up, and in consequence, the parrot goes to the play stand, okay? This is a favorable outcome. If you're, you're getting bit, you have to sit here and think of what is happening in the environment. Maybe you went in too quickly. Maybe you had a hat on that the bird's not used to. Maybe there was a balloon floating by in the background. There's always something going on for the behavior to happen. And then the way you react to that is going to shape future behaviors. Okay. If you have a bird that does not like to come out of its cage, and that's your issue. And we're gonna to touch a little bit on each thing only because not everybody has these types of issues. So if you have a bird that has an issue of coming out of the cage, uh, you want to put a perch on the door. And this way you can open the door, the bird is out, the bird is used to coming out. Getting him to target to that perch it's, and stationing is important with training. I have either perches or some sort of apparatus for them to sit on right near the door. And usually when we're ready to come out, everybody is on that perch and they know what's gonna happen, they're gonna come out and they're gonna to go to the tree. Nice. Now, this is one of my clients, this is Blarney, and he had a little bit of a rough start. He was with the same family for a long time and Superstorm Sandy hit. So he was sent to the pet store while they were trying to fix their house up. Um, from what I understand, he went back with the owners and then down the road, the owners got ill and then Blarney ended up back in the pet store. Um, I don't remember offhand how long he was in there, what was going on, but he didn't really want to come out of his cage. This is all relative new with his new home and you know everything in his environment is new. So he was, we don't want to become cage bound. So I noticed in the background during consultation this neat little uh, play stand. I instructed them to put it on the floor and just sit on the floor near the play stand you know, read, you know, play with some toys. And eventually Barney got the idea to come out and get down on the play stand himself. And now the next step is to show him that everything can be fun when he's out. So I'm very proud of them for what they've accomplished so far and they have a lot more to accomplish together. So this is something that all birds do. 
Throwing and wasting food. Again, this is another thing that clients come to me and say, my bird throws so much food, wasting so much food. What am I doing wrong? You're really not. They do this in the wild. They are repopulating the forest floors and that's not gonna change in our environment. You know, that's just something that's instinctual and they're gonna continue to do it. Um, so just keep offering and just know that you're not the only one that the bird is wasting food. So a lot of people will ask me that, you know, how do I get my birds to try new foods, eat new foods? Well, how do you encourage them? Well, you got to keep this little picture in mind because it is the truth. Um, if you have a bird that doesn't really want to try anything, if you eat in front of them, we all know if it's ours, it's better. So, like Terry and Diesel are doing, this is a perfect example of how to get your bird interested in something. Okay. Now we're going to being cautious. Um, cautiousness is, is much different than, you know, being neurotic or, um, phobic, you know, the neurosis starts when an issue is ignored and fears are amplified. Uh, in the wild, parents are teaching their birds, you know, what to be afraid of, what to do, and they don't have that in, in our environments. So again, I, most African greys are going to be terrified of a balloon. Um, you're not going to see that in the wild. So they don't know how to behave. They don't know how to act. A lot of birds are clipped so they can't escape. So they're gonna be very cautious. Their survival depends on it. So keep that in mind when you think that your bird's just being, you know, scary and, you know, it's afraid of everything. They kind of all are. Okay, we have preening. Um, we're gonna go back to this a little bit. I know I touched on it with the first webinar, but it's very, important to know the difference between preening and either feather barbering or destructive behavior. Now, each one of these birds here, you know, are doing what comes naturally to them. Mr. Who over here, if you can see my pointer, yeah. um, see these little feathers down here? These, these are um, feathers you're going to see all over your environment all the time. If you see me looking around, it's usually because one's going past my face as I'm talking. Yes. So um, this is part of natural behavior and this is not clucking. These little feathers down here, this is preening. They lose those feathers constantly. This is what they look like when they're growing in. And then they kind of expand. And here's one up on TMO's head. Um, they get everywhere. So, and then another thing you're noticing when they're back here by their butt, on top of their tail is a preen gland. So that's another thing they're doing is getting the oils out of the preen gland to weatherproof and, you know, make their feathers look pretty. Know that this is my Sydney here when his preen gland was impacted and he had to have surgery. Now, back to plucking versus mutilating. Um, feather abnormalities, plucking and mutilating, origins of feather destructive behaviors are complex. They could be medical, psychological, uh, yeah, psychological, environmental, combination thereof. Some birds simply overprain or shred feathers, others pluck out some of all their feathers within reach while others graduate to the most serious self-mutilating of their skin and underlying tissues. This little blurb was from a rescue um, that, or paperwork they send out to rescues to know what to look for. Um, it, when people ask me, they say, my bird is plucking, I'm always going to tell you to go to your vet. I can't guess what's wrong. There's so many things that could be going on and hopefully you go and there's nothing wrong and then we can work with you. But to simply just try to put something around their neck and not seek medical advice is, is not good because it could be something, could be nutritional deficiencies, 
Um, it, you know, it could be environmental, it could be allergies, bacterial, it could be something serious. And the only way you know that is if you go to the vet, have the, the paperwork done or the blood work done. And a lot of times with consults, I'll actually go through the paperwork as well to make sure that I know what I'm working with. If you ever see something like this, you're gonna see there's all different shapes, um, sizes, feathers, contact your vet. Again, this is my Sydney that did that. That's how I knew to check him and that's when he had the preen gland surgery. No matter what I did with behavior, he's not gonna do anything because he had an underlying issue. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to work. This is another video. Um, this is um, Einstein. Now, let me know if you can see or hear this. Yep, can see it. Now, there's some things I want you to pay attention for. We're gonna watch this, this whole video. This is the gray growl. If, wait a minute, I, I skipped one, but I'll go back to it after here. Um, this is Einstein again. If you have a bird that is afraid, you're gonna hear a growl. Um, a, lot of, a lot of African grays, you know, through your years, you're going to hear this if there's something that is not normal in the environment. Now, Einstein is afraid of here. In the, in the beginning, you can hear his dark throat rumble. Towards the middle and towards the end, he gets more of a drama queen with the high, high pitches. So I want you to kind of know the difference between your bird being afraid and kind of getting into a little drama queen here. <laughs> Quite a scream. That's quite a growl. <laughs> yeah, and that is, like I said, a, a lot towards the end was more drama. And believe me, Einstein got um, back at the rug. He destroyed it later on. So um, I think he was, you know, he wanted to, to play with it a little bit too. Because if you have a scared bird, he's not going to lean down to try to look at the rug. Instinct is going to get you away if he was really scared. Okay. Um, there's also a very happy gray growl, which I can't seem to find any videos online. They're usually very quick and it is a very high pitched growl. And a lot of people, including myself, will come running, hearing this growl, wondering what's going on with the birds. And in reality, it's just they're having a the time of their life playing with a toy. So, but that's a very high pitched and usually doesn't last as long as you just heard Einstein. This was the part that I skipped. This is the unique behaviors of the gray parrot. Um, growling is a unique um, behavior. I don't know any other bird that does that. This is Miss Emma sunbathing outside. I don't know what she's doing laying on her back there. Um, another behavior is chicken scratching. Now, other species may do this, but I haven't seen any of them do it. So. 
We're not exactly sure why they do it. It could be, um, you know, as, as babies, they're in there, they're just, they're scratching, um, they're learning to, to move around. A lot of people think the birds are trying to get out of the, out of the cage when they get them home. They do it in various different places. Um, both sexes do it, all ages do it. So I'm not really sure we know the reason for it, but I'm pretty sure everybody who has Greg has seen it. <laughs> and this will probably go on for as long as you let the bird do it. Um, this one's pretty good doing it with both legs. Sterling only does it with one and he tries with the other and he falls over. So that's pretty much it. The next thing is nail chewing. All birds do it to groom. And you can see with Max, he looks very relaxed. He's sitting there. He's probably more interested in what his owner's doing versus what he's doing. But you have the other bird over there um, where his mouth is open, his toe is in there, and it looks like he might be pulling his mouth down. If you see your bird doing that and he's on one foot and, it, and he's drooping his wings, um, it could be either A, there might be a little hormone going on, but also look into your environment to see if there's something going on that's frightening them. Um, in the wild, the bird, if it was nervous like that, it probably would have already taken off. Again, they don't have the option in their home, so they sit there, and I've actually seen Sterling, when he's gotten very scared, pull down on his beak and just move back and forth because he didn't know what else to do. That was when he did his own wing clipping. Uh, my guys are pretty much fully flighted, so I haven't seen him do that since his wings have grown in. The stink eye. These are some pretty good examples. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't seen my Amazons do this. I haven't seen any other birds do this, but this look here is a pretty good indication that you're going to get bit. So, you know, keep that in mind. And if they're squinting at you, yeah, there's, there's something else going on in their mind. So you kind of want to diffuse the situation there. It's not the best time to really go up to any of these guys and say, come on, sweetheart, pop up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then we have the bait and switch. This is another thing. Pretty much all African greys do it. They look very sweet, very innocent. They come over, they put their head down. They want to be tickled, and all of a sudden, they whip their head around and try to bite. Um, Thumper over there looks very unapologetic for you know, his little behavior. Um, but that's another thing. People will say, well, I'm scratching my bird and he turns around and he bites me. Yeah, they all pretty much do that. So if maybe you're hitting a pin feather coming in, uh, that might be the reason. Or it might just be fun because the behavior of him whipping his head around makes your hand withdraw. So that's the consequence of the behavior. So, um, but again, they all do that. Blushing. Um, a lot of people have seen that where the, the birds actually look pink. And Emma used to do that a lot when she was a baby um, to the point where I thought something was wrong with her. Um, African greys have the unique ability to blush, which is apparent in the white patches of their skin and eyes. It uh, doesn't mean they're embarrassed like people. It's usually when they're interested in something or they become stimulated. The small blood vessels in your facial patch dilate and give off a pinkish reddish tinge. Usually within a short period of time, it constricts and the blushing fades. Young birds tend to do it a lot more, maybe because of heightened interest or learning stages are being stimulated. Um, it also happens in other species with white face skin patches. Um, it's a flushing from stress and changes in the heart rate and most likely an adrenaline release when being held or restrained. And I talked to my vet, Anthony Pilney, um, out in Arizona. You guys are very lucky to have him out there. Um, he was the one that went over that with me so I could share with you guys. This is another thing he helped me on. Blood tears. Now, I hope this picture doesn't haunt you. <laughs> uh, African greys have the ability to shed tears in some instances. It's called blood tears. It's a pigment 
It's a color pigment from the glands. It's not real blood, but the tears appear red. It's been noted to happen when they're strained, do it during vet visits, the nervous, uh, as a, when they have a rise in blood pressure or infection. Um, we probably won't see that as owners. I have not, but I have friends that are in the field and they have. Um, the only thing I have seen is Sydney when he was a baby, he was overstimulated at the vet for the first time and he cried clear tears that were as big as his eyeballs. So um, it does happen. So those are some of the behaviors and I hope that um, I was able to help with a few things. These are a whole bunch of people that are joining in today. Um, the little birdies made <laughs> We're sitting there watching. Um, except for Taylor, rumor has it he was busy on his dating app instead. So thank you for joining and for helping me out with this. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully get up bigger to answer some questions and maybe do some examples with my own birds in the back. Okay. And Lisa, that last picture, that was your bird room, is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, Amazing. And this is everybody behind me. Um, <laughs> now, I see on, on the presentation, I see you very big on the screen. So how do I, I'm only in a little oh. square. So how do I get? Let's see, it's it just on your view mode. Um, on, you can do the gallery view or? That's better. All right. <laughs> Okay, so if anybody has any questions or need to see any examples, let me know and okay. they're, all, they're all here to help you. All right, well, uh, we do have our questions. Um, let's see, first one out the door is from Patricia. She says that I have two female Timna African Greys. One just will not stay off the top of the kitchen cabinets. I've tried putting several different things between the top of the cabinet and the ceiling, but need to be careful because of the glass top stove. Every time she gets up there, um, I think she has a spatula to get her down and tell her no, but 90% of the time when I go back to what I was doing, she goes right back to the top of the cabinets and has destroyed the top molding. Uh, clipping her ring, wings only lasts for a couple of weeks and then she has the strength to fly up there again. So um, Patricia says, I don't wanna keep her in the cage all the time. Do you have any questions or any suggestions? I thought of the treat method everyone talks about, but then she will know, she will get a treat when I get her down. So right. she doesn't want to positively um, reinforce the bird going on the top of the cabinets either, so. Right, um, actually these guys do really good with praise versus food. Um, some will be food driven. I mean, if you're working with an Amazon, that's fantastic because that's all they want. But grays really do good with good boy, good girl. So what I would suggest you do if you can is send me a picture of the cabinets up there from you know where her cage is where that is and it's kind of hard to give you advice without seeing it and trying to figure out what we can do together so if you're able to send me some pictures i'd appreciate it and um, we can go from there okay i think you can send the uh, those pictures patricia to uh the um the fever customer surface uh, service sorry um, custom, yeah, um, I'll get that one for you. Let's see here. Uh, okay, the next one is from Louisa. What is the behavior the parrot over your right shoulder is doing? Uh, squatting down with the wings not flapping open, but flapping. Let's see. This is my right. Um, nope. So squatting down, uh, let's see, when the bird's squatting down with the wings not flapping, but open. Uh -huh. This one right here with the head upside down? Probably, yeah, I'm gonna okay. guess. So um, that's Abby. And where my computer is set up is where her, all her toys and her food is located. And she is very interested in always being over here because she knows there's lots of good stuff. Now she can also see the computer and she also hears this noise coming out of it. And she is a very, no very nosy girl. So it's really that she's showing interest. Um, she has lots of other things to do up on her tree, but she wants to get down here. It could be because there's a magazine here, um, a glass of water, and she wants to get down in the middle of it. Yeah. 
She's trying to get, like get your attention on uh, something that yeah, she. Yeah, well, not, probably not mine. She's probably just yeah. She's she might end up flying over here because she's fully flighted. So you know, depending on how interested she gets. I mean, there's a drawer here, and if I open a drawer, see her stand up. She yeah. knows that's her. She knows that's her drawer, and that's where her toys are. What are you doing? All right. Next question is from. Uh, I think it's from Riz, Riz Ann. Uh, my gray has a history of biting, but his new thing is to fly at my back. It really hurts as he latches on and bites. He does this not just when he is at his cage. Wait, he does this not just when he is at his cage, just whenever he feels like it. Uh, unfortunately, she has, uh, they have scars and, and healing wounds from this. So any advice you can give to that? Right. Yeah. Um... Has he been seen by the vet lately to see if there's anything going on that would, you know, have a change in behavior? It is. We're just coming out of mating season right now. So I don't know if that could have any part of it. Um, if the lifestyle has changed, if there's somebody else in the household that might be getting a little bit more attention and he's a little bit jealous. But if it's a safety issue, what you may have to do is a baby clip. It's only one or two feathers, but it's making it harder for him to get to you because if he gets to you and he gets your face, um, you're going to lose all interest. And without working with him, he's going to end up being in another home. So if you're able to, and again, fully flighted is the best. But sometimes you just need to take it down a notch and make it a little harder to get to you or whoever he's attacking. And then you can work with them a little bit more and hopefully bring it down. But again, keep in mind, we're just getting out of breeding season. That could also go back to the lady with the cabinets with the bird going up there, breeding season, looking for a nest. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Um, let's see what our next question is. Um, Hi, Sterling. <laughs> oh, you know, someone had a comment. Uh, just uh, what if the bird isn't being scared, but just uh, cage territorial? Is there a different way to approach that then? I would still do the perch on the door. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to get him to come over to the perch. So whatever his favorite treat is, you're going to go over to the spot with the door closed. And that's where you're going to offer the treat is near the, near his perch. Okay. If he doesn't come to the perch, he doesn't get the treat. That's a, that's a problem that a lot of people do is they reward anyway, when you're not getting the behavior you need. But if you can get him over to the door, on that perch, that's where he gets a treat. And then little by little, you can work on opening that door. It might only be a half inch at a time, but that'll get him, you know, and then when you open the door, that's when you're able to give his treat inside. So he realizes it's not coming through the bars anymore. It's going around the door and work from that to try to get him out. They have to learn that being out is fun. Um, I have no issues with my guys coming out because they all get to go on their trees. They all have somewhere to go, something to do that's much more fun than being in the cage. So that's what we have to encourage. Okay. Um, and then Gloria wanted to know, um, let's see. All right, so I want to know, uh, are they, are your birds, are they clipped? Um, and if not, how do you know you have to give them, um, how do you have them stationed on their areas? So how do you keep them stationed where they are um, if they're not clipped? <laughs> well, no, mine, mine are not clipped. Uh, mine can fly except for Sydney because he has a baby clip because he is aggressive with everybody else. But these guys could fly to wherever they want. But because their area is fun and they have something to do except for Abby who is more interested in the computer, um, it, they usually stay there. Now with the stationing on the perch, at first the door is going to be closed, so they don't really have an option to fly around. Mm -hmm. As as the door opens, you know, then then they might, but then they might you're you're getting them used to opening a door a little bit at a time. So chances are when you open the door, they're not just going to take off willy-nilly. 
Um, but you always want to make wherever you put them fun. Now, if I just put them on the back of this chair, this chair isn't exactly fun, and I'm sure they'd be chewing on it because they're making their own entertainment. They don't know the difference. So if they have something to do to keep their minds and bodies occupied, that's where we'll stay. Okay. Uh, and then Shaylee asked, have you tried to introduce uh, birds of other species in, your, in the flock? Um, how has the reaction of the grays been, if that is the case? I've had different species all through my years, and I never really um, had any issues with different species being in the flock. Um, I do have a kayak as well. I would say that he's my husband's bird. Um, the size difference is much different, so they have to be watched because when the kayak flies, the grays all snap at the air like he's bug. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that I, I have this little tree, okay? Um, it's a little tabletop, and it usually sits underneath Abby's tree. Now, one day the kayak was out there, and somehow he figured out how to climb up a toy, and when I looked in here, he was sitting right next to Abby. Scared me. I came running in because she could hurt him. She didn't. Um, and that, that was the last time that I allowed that on the bottom. I moved him over to Sterling's tree now on the bottom so he can't climb up because um, he can't reach any of the, the toys there. But, you know, the other ones would be fine. It, it's just really Sydney. I think he just dropped on his head as a chick. <laughs> All right. And then, uh, so S S Sydney had a question. Um, why does my girl let my husband hold and rub her head, but when he tries to put her down, she bites him? She doesn't do this with me, though. Yeah, it's probably that's her way of showing him that she doesn't really want to be put down. So depending on where you're putting a bird down, if she's putting him down, if he's putting her in a cage, um, I would try to offer her something to do to look forward to going into the cage, say if she's going in at night and she doesn't want to get off. If you have something, whether it's a little foraging toy or something special to that time, it could be as easy as a piece of paper towel for her to rip up. They don't have to be expensive. Put that in there, that's the time she gets it and it'll preoccupy her. Um, at my Emma, I'll grab her, come here, sweetheart. Come here, come here. Okay, so this is my little disabled girl. And she will, she never broke the skin, but she will chew on me if I try to take her away from my husband because she really likes my husband. Um, so if I distract her with something else while I'm putting her or taking her, that's the way to preempt the bite. Mm. Oh, nice. very cute. Thank you. Bye, Gamma. Put it on your face. <laughs> Do grays generally like, do, I mean, do a lot of grays like to go on their back? Is that something that's unique or? Um, it depends. Emma does because her, her neck and spine are twisted. So I'll find her upside down quite a lot. Um, Sam, who is my most recent rehome, she's watched Emma flip over. So now Sam flips over. Abby's been with me for several years. I'm not trying it with her. <laughs> so she's not going to have any of that. Nice. All right. So then Marla had a question. Um, she says, I have a Congo African gray that screams when I leave the room. I've tried to give him toys to keep him busy, but he drops them. He wants no part of toys when I leave the room. I don't know what else to do to control the screeching. Okay. So again, before you're leaving the room, what is happening? He's going in his cage. Um, you've tried different things to offer him and you turn your back, you walk away. And that's when he starts his screaming or is it once you're out the door and he's screaming? Um, we have to find something he finds valuable. If he doesn't like being in the cage, we have to give him something fun to do. Um, you know, it, it, you could have tried 50 toys and those 50 toys just weren't a valued toy. So it's, you have, to, you have to keep trying. Now, when I put my guys away or when I put them to bed at night because they don't sleep in this room, they have another room, 
um, I'll put them in and I'll say, you be good, I'll be back. And so they're calm when I'm putting them in there. Um, Abby, I'll give her something to do because she's actually the first one to go in. Um, I put on my, my cheaters, my glasses at night so I could check their ears, their eyes and everything before they go to bed. Abby does not like glasses. So I can't really do that to her. So I'll put her in there and I'll give her something to do while I'm checking everybody else. Cause otherwise she will, if she wants to be out and she wants to have her way, she will scream. So I preoccupy her with something else. So if they want to send me a list of some of the things they've tried, I might be able to give them some more options. Okay. Um, and then Nikki asks, um, she, well, Nikki says, I have a 33 year old gray Kipling who has been a wonderful talker and mimicker. But since my husband has died, as well as his favorite dog, he has become uh, very quiet. Any suggestions on how to get him back to his old self? How, I, I would need to know how long ago that happened, how long the bird has been going through this. Um, I actually wrote an article, it's called Helping Your Gray Through Grief. And it kind of explains maybe what, what, they're, what they're thinking or why um, their personalities do change. I've seen that with my own birds. If something has happened when I had two birds that lived with my father, uh, they didn't necessarily like me at all growing up, but when my father got ill, they had no choice but to come live with me. One bird, Sterling, did wonderfully. The other one, he would sit with his back towards me. He would shiver. He was quiet. Um, he, he did not do very well. So that's how I learned that he was going through a grieving stage as well. So, um, it's probably going to be a little bit more special time, but if this happened like five years ago, it's a little bit different process than say it happened last month. So, um, you know, again, I, I would need to know a, a little bit more detail, but I think a little bit more special one-on-one -on -one time, even if it's not touching, maybe just reading, maybe just sitting, maybe just sharing something special, um, explaining to them what happened. And, you know, I think that would be a good, good place to start. Okay. Um, and then Donald, uh, says uh, my gray gives no body language indication before he bites any suggestions on how to approach positive reinforcement to teach our gray not to bite while avoiding getting bit during the training process okay um again i want a video yeah. uh if they can a video and i want to watch the behaviors to see if i can pick up it might be the slightest little thing that the owner's not noticing, or maybe the owner is looking at their hand versus the bird or um, the slightest little thing that they could look for. Normally it's the eyes, but I know some birds get tall and skinny before they're about to bite. Some birds, you know, they hunch over and their feathers get bigger before they're about to bite. So it could be the most subtle thing. Um, like I know right now, if I put my hand up to Abby, She's overly excited. She's gonna get me. That's that's why when somebody asked me, I didn't put my hand up to her. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> but the other ones, I wouldn't have an issue with. So, but please send me a video so I can I can look at it. And a lot of these things, it, it's very hard to give exact advice without knowing more. You know what happens before and what happens after. Okay. Yeah. These, uh, some of these are little, little unique situations, uh, per the household. So that's right. understandable. And, and what might work for me may not work for you. And we work together to get something done. All right. Good advice. Um, uh, so Chris asked, is there any truth that male grays are better talkers? Is there any gender behaviors worth noting? So are there any behaviors between the, the male and female grays? Um, I haven't noticed one being a better, better talker, uh, male or female, um, not even with the Timna versus Congo. Um, what I've noticed is my boys do tend to be a little bit more hormonal and huffy. Again, but my situation is I have three girls, I have two boys. So we have some excited boys going on here. <laughs> they will tend to bite quicker 
and not really care, like not even look at you like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. They're like, yes, sir. So the males are, are quicker like that. So I have to watch them a little bit more than my females. My females do tend to be a little bit more lovey and more outgoing. The girls would probably go to anybody. They like my husband just as much as they like me. My boys, you know, especially Sterling, he likes the way my husband tastes. But other than that, you know, he's 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 my boy. So, um, yeah. So, Lisa, um, kind of going off of Chris's question, um, are there any difference between Congo and Timna African Greys as as far as um, behaviors? I, our behaviors yeah. my first spray was actually a Timna. He was a wild caught Timna. And it was my first spray. I was very nervous back in the early 90s when I got him because I was used to cockatiels and conures. Um, he was actually a very, very sweet boy. And you know, I would I would actually put his personality more towards my females. And I don't think at this point, I don't think I had him DNA. So for all I know, he could have been a female. But I've seen a lot of my clients, especially when I went to the houses and did, have done grooming when I was in New Jersey. They've had Timnas, they were very sweet, um, you know, talking to the moment they saw me and then all of a sudden they didn't like me because, you know, I'm the groomer. So even though my toys and my, you know, presence afterwards didn't make up for it. So. <laughs> All right. I'm sure you got some, uh, maybe got some talk back from some of the un, uh, not not too happy grays being gro groomed back in the day. Yes. Yeah, actually, my sterling talks back a lot, um, a lot. So usually he says what and no. So um, yeah. All right. So, uh, Pam uh, Pam says that my gray has been laying her head in her food bowl and even sleeping that way. She has a she has a hooded crock, and she does. She does like to make noises so that it echoes. Is this something to be worried about? She just started doing this since she started laying eggs. All right, so it could be hormonal. If you have another type of bowl, I would suggest that. There are crocs that don't have the hoods. A lot of these birds are seeking out darker spots now. And you know, I've seen it where a bird just put a bell on the head and they just figured, well, you can't, you, I can't see you, you can't see me. So she might be thinking the same thing, putting her head in there thinking she has a nest. So I would look for a different croc. And if that behavior continues, see a vet. Because you, you want to you deter really having eggs because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So you don't want her to have a continuous stream of eggs and become calcium deficient or egg bound or anything like that. So try to try to take away that hooded vent and, and see. Okay. Um, let's see here. I think, uh, let me see if we, I think we're actually, uh, we are actually uh, on time here. Um, I mean, out of time, sorry, not out of time. But uh, we do have a, a lot of questions. Um, so we'll try to, let's see. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, we will uh, send you, we'll try to send you an email answer. So um, that's why, you know, use the Q&A button so we can capture that information and then send you out an answer. Um, so just real quick, I'm gonna announce today's winner. We do have a, a giveaway um, and that's of the uh, Lefebvre Tropical Fruit Pellet and also a bag of Lefebvre food of your bird's choice. And the winner for today is Daniela M. So congratulations, Daniela. Um, someone from the Lefebvre office will be saying, uh, reaching out to you uh, next week to send the bag, uh, bags of food to you. So um, congratulations. And um, let's see, Lisa, thank you so much for, for enlightening us on, on the gray parrot behavior. Uh, so, so in such an interesting, um, bird that, that it really has a, a, a following of, I mean, just one that really captivates people. So um, yeah, thank so you for shedding light on that. I apologize for my computer <laughs> problems going on over here. Um, I apologize for the delay and not being able to figure out where I was in the program. 
So. Oh gosh, that, 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 that's why uh, Zoom is so exciting because you know those you never know it's it, it's live so uh, or you know it, yeah you never know it's going to happen and that's funny uh, they just dropped a toy behind you there huh was that what? yeah that was probably yeah that was probably Sydney over there I think so. Sydney was working on that the whole time and and finally right towards the end you know Matt. yep so I think it kind of proves that a busy beak is a quiet beak <laughs> so, I think we proved their point. There you go. And we got a lot of, you know, thank yous pouring in um, on the chat. So that, I mean, obviously a lot of people really appreciate your time and, um, and your insights. I enjoy it. I enjoy and um, it. just to remind people that next Friday, we will be back with um, Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. So if you have a question, um, you know, a, a health related question about your bird, uh, you want to tune in next Friday um, and see if uh, Dr. Tolley can answer that for you. So. Um, well, Lisa, this is always a great, I mean, I can't think of a bird species that, that, that really, really has a dedicated community. So, um, maybe we can revisit more great, more, more great topics, uh, going forward. So yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining in and for sending your pictures. Oh yeah, those are adorable. So yeah. That, <laughs> all right, guys. So, uh, everyone have a great weekend. Everyone stay safe and all the best to you and your flock until next time. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Bye.